Right, so welcome again, Edwin, to this version of this, this particular yoga chat on Advaita Vedanta. Uh, so we're going to try and understand the root concepts of Advaita today. Uh, it's really popular in the West these days. There's loads of uh, Advaita, te- uh, Western Advaita teachers swinging around. There's Neo Advaita, but it's, it gets a little bit confused. And I'm actually confused myself about um, what exactly Advaita means. And so who better perhaps to help us but Edwin. So um, yeah, I mean, basically in a nutshell, what is it? Is it something to do with, um, it's non-dual basically, right? My understanding is, yeah, right. Well, Advaita is one stream of Vedanta. Right. And Vedanta is the stream of, um, it's basically exegesis, which means interpretation of sacred texts. That And so the Vedanta is that exegetical stream that flows from the Upanishads. So this foundational text is the Upanishads. So what? So the Upanishads are considered Shruti, that which was heard. They're the most sacred of texts. Even more, you know, just like the Islam has the, the Quran, and then it has the Hadith, but if there's any sort of conflict, the Quran comes out on top. And the Hadith is sort of accumulated material that's, accepted as authoritative as as provided it doesn't contradict the Quran. It's a bit like that. You have um, the the Shruti, which are the Vedas and the Upanishads and a couple of other things that we don't need to worry about. And then the most sacred text of Hinduism. So all later schools, whether it's Tantra or Shaiva or Vaishnava or Krishna, um, they have to find some kind of peg in the Upanishads, right? some kind something in the Upanishads that they can say well this is really this, our tradition is is indicated here in seed form and we've taken that seed and we've developed it right so the tantricas have you know there's a couple of places in the Upanishad that speak of nardis and they say oh look that's the subtle physiology even you know kundalini might not be mentioned but as long as something krishna's not mentioned but you might have some kind of a theistic statement or there's one reference to anyway so in this way The Upanishads are kind of like, if you want to be an orthodox Hindu, this is the crux of the matter. Mm -hmm. Or you don't want to go off and start your own thing. You want to say, I'm I'm a Vedika, I'm I'm follow the Vedic system. You can't just make stuff up. You have to find some kind, just like if you want to be a Christian, you know, you might say, I don't know, you might say Christ was an alien who came for, but you have to find some way of situating that in the, in the Bible. And you have to look here, that UFOs, whatever it is. Right, that's being a bit ridiculous, but but you get the point. So, given that, the Upanishads then become because the old Vedas are so completely different, you know, hymns to the you know, it's, it's really the Upanishads where the schools find their point mm. of origin. So, uh, what was the uh, what was the time difference, by the way, in between the Vedas and the Upanishads? Well, if you go by academic dates, you you've got centuries. You know, the the date the Vedas are probably dated fifteen. 1500 BC to 1200 BC would be the Vedas. And the oldest Upanishad, like the Brihad, would be 8th century. So a few centuries later. And just as an aside, particularly because someone really wanted to know this, when was yoga first mentioned in the Vedas? Was it mentioned in the Vedas at all? The Tara and the Karta Upanishads. It's not mentioned mentioned before Vedas, no. Right. If it's mentioned, it means something else. I mean, these terms have earlier meanings that, that are not the same as the later meanings. But just to finish that point then, yeah. so the problem with the Upanishad, I don't know if it's a problem, but the nature of the Upanishads, it's not systematic philosophy. They're kind of just kind of like, you know, different sages articulating um, different truths and so forth. And there's a lot going on there. There's scholars who, who actually don't look at the, read the Upanishads and see it more as rivalry between political kingdoms and so on. But Vedanta wants to read the, Upanishads, the primary teaching of the Upanishads to be about Brahman, right? So the first verse of the, uh, I'm getting to your question about Advaita, just give me a second to- No, 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 this is very interesting. We'll end up there, we'll end up there. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I got my eye on the ball, uh, I hope. So then, um, so then the, you know, the first statement of the Vedanta is Atato Brahma Jignasu, like the first verse of uh, Yoga Sutras is Atta Yoga Anushas. And I'm right now, we're gonna do, continue teaching the yoga. Well, in a similar fashion, the first verse of Vedanta is Tato Brahma Jignasu. Now we're going to inquire into Brahman. So for the Vedantins, 
the real purpose of the of the Upanishads, the primary teachings, is about Brahman. Now, what is this Brahman, and what is its relationship with the world, and what is its relation, and what is the living entity's role in that triad triad of entities? The Upanishads themselves don't take systematic. You know, in some places, it, it appears that Brahman is a personal being who decided and willed creation. In some places, these souls are, uh, you know, are presented as little monads, individualized monads. But in other places, uh, it seems like the, the souls are not really individual monads. And when they, you know, like rivers, they eventually flow to the sea and become one with the sea. Mm. So that's one of the famous passages. So it seems to be to it, it, it seems to be the soul is seems to be presented as somehow one or even merging into Brahman. So there's all of these possibilities. Now, if you're a Vedantin or if you're an Orthodox Hindu, you can't say Upanishads are disorganized. You can't say, oh, they're incoherent. You can't say they're conflicting or contradictory. You can't say that because they're divine revelation. You don't want divine revelation to be imperfect. So you have to say, no, no, they're perfect divine revelation, but we need a lens. And if we look at them through this lens, we will see they're perfectly consistent. And that's why you have, to, so then the Vedanta Sutras are written by a sage called Badarayana, just like Patanjali writes the Yoga Sutras. He's also trying to schematize all these previous references to yoga here and there in the Upanishads in the Mahabharata. He wants to, you know, he schematizes it. And from that point on the Yoga Sutras becomes the go-to canonical text for yoga. So the Vedanta Sutras was written for similar sorts of reasons. The problem with the Vedanta Sutras are they're so cryptic. You can't understand. You, the, you, know, the, the, you know, the sutra may be two or three words, no verb, and it's referring to some passage in the Upanishad, but it doesn't tell you which reference. It doesn't tell you. So therefore, we now you, so even though the Vedanta was supposed to systematize the Upanishads, you now have to in, not only interpret the Upanishads, you now have to interpret the Vedanta Sutra because probably these were oral traditions. Uh, and so, and so centuries after the, the Vedanta Sutra, we have the first commentator, Shankara, comes along in the eighth to ninth century. And that could be, you know, if the, if the if we go, let's go with academic dates, of course, Hindus would date them much, much older. It doesn't matter, who cares? Let's say the academic date, the, let's say Vedanta's dated at like third century, or something like that, third century, the common era. I mean, so, some dated, you know, third century BCE. Um, I, I'm a bit wobbly on the date. It's been a while since I looked at that. But anyway, it, many centuries later, along comes Shankara. And his way of reconciling the apparent conflicting statements of the Upanishads and the lens that he offers, so this is a Dwaita. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In a minute. Yeah. He says, when the Upanishads talk about a real world, a real creation with a real creator with souls, they're talking about conventional, apparent, apparent, very important word, apparent reality. Right. But when the Upanishads speak about, you know, that Brahman is beyond form and beyond name and the world is unreal and the souls merge into Brahman, that's then they're talking from the perspective of Paramartika, high, this uh, ultimate, real, genuine reality. Hmm. So he creates this two tiered schema. And all, all passages in the Upanishads that speak of undivided, impersonal Brahman, he says, ah, now they're talking from the Paramartika, the highest perspective. And all passages that talk about real souls and real world and real. God and real creation, oh, that's just conventional. So the conventional reality is unreal for it's Jagat Mityam, Brahman Satyam, Jagat Mityam. The world is unreal. The individuality of the soul is unreal. The creation is unreal. So ultimately a creator is unreal. It's only, it is real in, in conventional reality. He'll defend it when he's debating Sankhya and other schools. He'll defend Ishvara against the Sankhya traditions. But when he's doing that, he's doing it from the, you know, if the world was real, well, of course it has to have a creator, right? So in that sense, he's like intelligent, he, you know, he would, be, he would support intelligent design, mm. but, but ultimately it's unreal. So how do we get from there? So therefore on that ultimate highest reality, uh, Twitter, there are no two, there are no <laughs> dualities. 
What, what are the dualities? Well, the duality between one soul and another soul, that's a duality. A duality between the soul and Brahman, that's another duality. The duality between Brahman and the world, another duality. The duality within the world between one ingredient, ultimate metaphysical category of reality and another, another duality. Dualities between God and creation, all of that for him, all of that is illusory. And um, he just, I just going to interrupt for one second. I mean, that itself is a duality, isn't it? A false and a real gives it. I mean, how does he escape that position? Well, or is, are we coming on to that? We're coming on to that. that right. His opponents consider that to be his uh, Achilles heel. It is a bit of an Achilles heel. Is this the uninvolved name and form part? Well, the Achilles heel is if you say everything is illusion, then what is illusion? Yeah, but it's a dualistic it's perspective. It's yeah. Maya. Yeah. Is it in? You can't be in Brahman because that's saying like saying darkness is in the. There's sun. two things. Yeah, it's impossible. It can't be outside of Brahman because then you have a duality. It can't be covering a part of Brahman, which is what Vaishnava say, because then you have a, duali a duality within Brahman. So Shankara doesn't address this issue, but later his later, you know, right after him, it becomes a major point of contention, and it, it, as tradition says, it's anirvachaniya. It cannot be spoken about. It's beyond comprehension which obviously is not a philosophical sort of thing to say, um, but and that's not going to satisfy any of his opponents and who are going to say, right, you want to say the world is unreal? All right, let's have a little think about that. What is this unreality? What is this Maya? And what's the relationship between Maya and Brahman? Because you just exactly, you just hit the nail on the head. That, that points to a duality. And that major is the major argument that has ha been handed down since Shankara's time for 1,200 years this, because as Ramanuja puts it, the first, the next great Vedantin, Kasya Avidya, in Sanskrit, Kasya Avidya, whose Avidya is this? Where, where are you going to locate it without creating a, a duality? So you really got that bit. Um, but let me just tidy up and then we'll move on to why, you know, why is it so popular? I don't know if that's mm -hmm. speculation on that. So, um, so therefore, just the word Dwaita, is cognate with Latin duo, right? Duo. In English, we have duo. Actually, the English word two, T, the T and the D, and the U yeah. and the W. So that's all cognate, all goes back to an Indo European root, pointing to some kind of a, a binary. And then a uh, is a negator. So just like we have theist, a uh, the, atheist, even, even today in English, we've inherited that old Euro Indo European negator. So Advaita means no dualities whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So that's the classical Advaita position. Um, so even though, you know, Shankara wrote poetry and he wrote all this, you know, Bhaja Govinda, he wrote this devotional poetry. <clears throat> you go down to the Sringeri Mat in South India, the stronghold, they're all doing pujas and temples and ringing bells. But they, for them, this is only sadhana. It's only practice that when we're in the world of illusion, we have to do these things. But the point is to eventually get to a place where you're beyond all of that and you realize there is no Ishvara, there are no temples, there is no you do offering bhakti to somebody else. There are no mm -hmm. dualities at all. But you may, when you know, you may need to use dualities to get to, you know, to get just like Patanjali, you have to use the mind to get beyond the mind. Mm -hmm. A bit like that. <clears throat> So that's classical Advaita. 